In this video, I'm going to show you how I programmed my real life wizard chessboard. Let's get started. Before I begin explaining, you should probably start from the beginning and watch the trailer for this series if you haven't already. Alright, so I'm going to do my very best at explaining the code, but since it's so long, I just really can't be explaining everything in detail. I'm just going to give you an overall explanation of how the code works. First of all, the code you're going to see is my prototyping code in Unreal Engine. The reason I first wrote it in Unreal Engine Blueprints and then converted it to C++ is because Unreal Engine Blueprints are just much more visual. And of course, I was able to test it without having to upload it to an Arduino. This also means that the code you're going to see is not at all optimized. This is just because I was programming and really didn't want to worry about that. But please don't comment about it because 90% of the code you're going to see was optimized when I converted it to C++. For example, I was able to remove this entire part. The way the code works in Unreal Engine is that you first give it the start location, then the target location, and it will show you what it would do step by step. This made prototyping really easy, but it also means that this version of the code doesn't have voice control input or motor movement output. That's because these things are much easier and I will explain them in my upcoming videos. The code is split up into 8 steps, of which 3 are copies of other steps, but just with different variables. So basically 5 completely different steps. The first part checks if your move is allowed. First it checks whose turn it is. If it's black's turn, it looks through all the black pieces and finds the piece that is in the same location as your move's start location. If it's black's turn but there are no black pieces on the inputted start location, it signals a wrong move. If there is a piece on the start location, depending on which piece it will send a signal to the appropriate code. That code then calculates, depending on which piece it is moving, if the move is valid. If it is valid, it goes on to step 2. Step 2 checks if there are any pieces being captured. And if so, it also determines where to place them. If there is no piece being captured, it skips straight to step 6. If there is, it determines where to put it and goes on to step 3. The reason it skips to step 6 if there is no piece being captured is because steps 3 and 4, 4 and 7 and 5 and 8 do exactly the same thing, but 3 through 5 do the movement logic for the captured piece and 6 through 8 for the normal piece. That's also why I was able to combine them. Step 6 checks which path has the least amount of obstacles. It starts by saving how many obstacles are on path 1 and 2. Then it compares the two and saves the result in a boolean variable. It also, depending on the shortest path, saves each of the squares it will move through. Then finally, it moves on to step 7. Step 7 is probably the most complex step of all. First, it moves the magnet to a start location, the place where a pawn currently is. When it gets there, it checks if there is an obstacle in the direction in which it is supposed to move. If there is, it checks one by one many pre-programmed ways of moving it. As you can imagine, the first options are pretty simple, but it gets more and more complex. It also saves the start and target location of each obstacle. This is also where the saved tiles or squares get used. Since I saved all the tiles the piece moves through, it can use this information to make sure it doesn't move the obstacle just a bit further in the path. If there is no obstacle in the way, it turns the magnet on and starts moving the piece to a target location. If it gets there, it moves on to step 8. If there are any obstacles in the way, it runs the same code as before. I already showed the code that calculates where obstacles are and where to move them. But that's all it does. It doesn't actually move them. This part does. If there are any obstacles still needing to be moved, it goes to this part turns off the magnet and moves to the location of the obstacle. When it gets there, it moves on to this code, which turns the magnet on and moves it to its target location. 
when it gets there, it saves the obstacle as moved and goes on to the next obstacle that has not been moved, if there are any. Now what the code has done is check if the move is valid. Move the main piece and move obstacles out of the way. The only thing left to do is move the obstacles back to their original positions. So this code is almost exactly the same as what I just showed you. It goes to the current location of the obstacle and then moves it to its original location. It does this with each of the obstacles in reverse order. So the last one that was moved first. When that's all done, it resets all the variables and changes the current player. This explanation is grossly oversimplified, but I just want to give you an idea of how the system works. If I were to explain every single line of code, I'd still be here doing this voiceover in a week. There's also some parts I just completely skipped, like the special moves code, because it's just very complex and almost never gets used. I also didn't explain the back code, which enables the player to just say back or go back and it will move everything back one turn. The reason is the same, way too complex for how much it gets used. And finally, as I said in the beginning, the C++ code is optimized. This is not. At all. I hope you liked the video. I know it's a bit more theoretical than usual. If you did like it, then like and consider subscribing, I'd really appreciate it.